for dessert. So if you're on one of those lifestyle changes or those diets, just throw that out the window and go have some chocolate cake for dessert. And then we're going to have our guest speaker come up shortly. Prospect Bay wait staff that are here this evening that are actually student athletes at Ken Island High School or previous student athletes at Ken Island High School. So if you come out here, we have Natalie who played field hockey and lacrosse. Caden, wrestling and track. We have Kate that plays softball and field hockey. Michael played football. William did wrestling and football. And Olivia did field hockey and swam. So staff here, student athletes. Coach Brian Sofanowski. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not a big podium person. It's just not who I am. Um, I'm just not who I am. I don't ever stand behind the desk. It's pretty incredible standing here after 20 years getting out of high school and seeing so many faces. Uh, my mentor, uh, teacher, football coach, uh, somebody I work for, probably one of the most respected men that I've ever worked for, Dave Cooper. The family of probably one of the greatest men I've ever known in Andy Shipple's family. And then uh, seeing all the faces of the young athletes that I've taught in the classroom is pretty awesome. It's an honor to be announcing the guest speaker tonight, Dr. Ed Baker. Uh, I met Dr. Baker in 1993, very fresh out of the military, and I'm walking into a college classroom and I'm like, what is this civilian world going to be like? I don't know, I'm not quite sure what it's going to be like. And Dr. Baker is a tall, menacing man that's kind of loud and I'm like, oh boy, here we go. And he starts talking. And it was probably one of the best classes that I've ever taken in my entire life. Two things about Dr. Baker. Number one, he loved what he did as a teacher. Number two, he loved his students. And hopefully I took that away as I started teaching for the last 20 years. Uh, he's a pretty humble man, so he wouldn't tell me a whole lot about himself. So I did some research and looking and all that kind of stuff. He graduated with his bachelor's degree from West Virginia Wesleyan. He got his master's at Western Maryland and his PhD at Virginia Tech. Uh, he's a Golden Gloves boxer, which I never knew about. Wow. And um, he was just, he, everything he did, he did with greatness. And he was, he taught at Chesapeake College for 43 years, retired, and he's still teaching fitness and wellness. Probably the greatest class I ever took in my life. <laughs> um, and it had nothing to do with athletics. It was just learning who you are as a person. Um, he was a basketball coach, a baseball coach. One of his teams actually had the best record, basketball record at Chesapeake College for 37 years. Um, he was the very first president of the Baseball, Softball, and Basketball Association on Eastern Shore of Maryland. Uh, and he was an inductee for the Athletic 
uh, Hall of Fame at Chesapeake College. So it's my honor to announce Dr. Eric Baker. I hope everybody can hear me, okay? I don't use mics. I don't use notes or mics, okay? Uh, let me start off by telling you that they say wisdom has two parts. One part is having a lot to say. Uh, the second part is not saying it. And I want to warn everybody that I struggle with that second part, okay? Uh, I have been blessed in my career to teach over 12,000 students at Chesapeake College. I have several of them here, Devin and Jamie and uh, Andy Schippel and I played softball together. Dave Cooper and I played softball together. So it was quite an honor when uh, Brian asked me to come and speak to you a little bit. I gotta watch this time, make sure I don't talk too much. But anyway, uh, what I'm gonna do, <coughs> I chose to stay with uh, two classes and I will teach them as long as I'm able. Uh, one is called Wellness for Life, the greatest class I ever taught in my life, and the other one is Stress Management. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring a couple highlights from those two classes in to share with you tonight, and hopefully you can take something from them. In uh, the Wellness for Life class, we break down wellness into seven components or seven categories. And I'm gonna go over them very quickly and what I think about them and a couple comments about each one. The first one is called spiritual wellness. And understand, spirituality can be many things. Um, most people identify with spirituality one of two ways, through religion or through something that gives you meaning, direction, purpose, and passion. The part that I want you, is that okay? Yep, perfect. Uh, the part that I want you to take from that is it really does not matter what you have in your life as long as you have something spiritual. Uh, there was a gentleman that I thought the world of, his name was Dr. Dean Ornish, and his definition of spirituality was a positive connection between yourself, others, and a higher power. And so I'm going to blend that in a little bit with my talk tonight and basically with the emphasis is you gotta have something there. Over the last two years, unfortunately, six of my former students have OD'd, and I have been blessed by having a lot of my former students contact me to try to get some help, and I do that on a regular basis. But I hope that I don't have to tell you that we have a real concern in our society with chemical substance abuse. Somebody asked me the other day, <clears throat> in all my years of working with people, what are the three primary drugs that provided the most difficulty? And there's no question in my mind. Number one was alcohol. And number two was heroin. And number three was crack cocaine. And there are a lot of reasons for that. And it wasn't necessarily the physical dependency. What really was the reason was the emotional, psychological, and mental uh, dependency to those drugs. So. If you are out there, you need to understand that life is a lot more difficult than we are. Uh, it's a lot tougher than we are. So you got to have something. You got to have some good friends. You got to have some form of spirituality to lean on. The next one I want to talk about is something called emotional wellness. There are more people today that have concerns with emotional wellness than physical concerns. And believe me, it's a tough road. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I'm not gonna to try to bore you in any way, shape, or form. But at the end of my class, I have my students write an assessment of how well they are. And just to give you a little interesting part, I had a paper this semester where a young man wrote 57 pages on emotional wellness alone his definition of it, what he was trying to do to try to help himself and all this kind of stuff. And so it just gives you an example of what's going on. My definition of emotional wellness is two things. One, the ability to control emotion. And two, the ability to express emotion. Now let me talk a little bit about control. That's where the stress management comes in. 
I teach a class at Chesapeake called Stress and Stress Management. When the schedule comes out, usually within two days, it is closed. And there's a couple reasons for that. One, I hope, because I'm teaching it. But another reason is there's just a lot of people that need some help in that area. It's one of the greatest things I've ever learned. The top four killers in our society, heart attack, cancer, stroke, and COPDs, all have a very specific aspect of each one of them associated with a person's inability to control stress and tension. And so when you can do that, you really have a hold of something that's so, so important. As far as the expression of emotion, I got a sign at home that my wife gave me and it basically says, unless you love someone, nothing else matters. So hopefully you'll have somebody to love. I love the word like. Let me tell you a little quick story on that. My youngest daughter, when she was in high school, she used to have a different boy parade through the class, uh, house every week. And my wife would look at me and say, you don't even talk to him. What's wrong with you? I said, why should I talk to him? You know as well as I do they won't be here next week. You know. So anyway, she goes to college, and I'll never forget this. And so every Saturday in the afternoon, my wife would call her and she would uh, get on the phone with her for 45 minutes, and I got five, you'd say. And I said to her this one day, I'm just sitting there talking to her, and I said, sweetheart, <clears throat> she's a freshman now. I said, how's your love life? Okay. And she said, dad, I'll never forget this as long as I live. She said, dad, I think I'm in like. I said, you're what? She says, I'm in like. I said, I'll be darned. So I hung up the phone, looked at her mother, and said, this is him. She's in like. So what does that mean? You just think about it sometimes when you love someone. You love them at different levels. You know, you love them every day and so on and so on. But it's a lot harder to like than it is love. So what's one of your goals? Be likable. See? Work on that. See what you can do. And so go up to people and tell them how much you love them. Tell them how much you like them. And then this is another great word, appreciation. There's a lot of educators sitting in this room, and let me tell you something. There's a lot of reasons we teach and we work with young people. Money is not one of them, okay? But one of them is appreciation. And when you have people in your life that appreciate what you do, you want to go back. And you want to do it over and over and over, and that's what I've been blessed to do for all these years. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is social. Understand a little bit about being socially well. I'm not just talking about a person's ability to go to a party and having everybody come around them and talk to them and all that kind of stuff. When you become socially well, the first thing you want to be able to do is be able to express what you think and feel. And sitting in this room, we have a lot of people. We have a lot of people in here that are great listeners. We have a lot of people in here that can talk very well. Very seldom do I meet a person, and here's the key word, who control the middle of those two where they know when to talk and they know when to listen. And I went to a listening seminar once and we took this test, what kind of listeners we were on a scale from one to 10, I got a minus 412. <laughs> and so the point being, I went home and I called my oldest daughter and I said to her, one of the things I was very proud of myself was I'd always talk to her when she was in middle school, when she was in high school, I'd talk to her about all the things in her life and all this kind of stuff. And I said, sweetheart, remember all those great talks we had? I said, you never opened your mouth, did you? She said, no, I couldn't. You did all the talking. And I said, oh my goodness. See? So I told her right then, I said, we're going to make a pack. Now she was not a sir. She did not express what she thought and felt. I expressed too much. See? So I said, here's what we're going to do for the rest of our life. You're going to learn to talk. I'm going to learn to listen. And listening, and let me give you a great statistic about listening. The greatest listeners in the world retain approximately 5% of what they hear two weeks later if they haven't written it down. Two weeks, 5%. So understand that's an art. And there's a lot of ways to test yourself if you're a good listener or not. You know, do you make eye-to-eye -eye contact with somebody? Do you show them body language whenever they're telling you something that is important to them for you to listen to? So I could go on a little more with the social part, but, but here's a good one. For anybody out there that's just starting out and trying to, and, and I don't care if you're starting out or not, 
I have something I call the one hand theory. And what does that mean? It means that you will go out and you will find five people that you trust and respect. Now listen to those two words. What I love about those two words is they have to be earned. I can't walk up to somebody and say, I want you to trust me. I want you to respect me. It just doesn't happen. So what you have to do is earn that. And when you can get five people that uh, earn your trust and respect, then you put them together and you make what I call the one hand theory. And that's how I teach it in my class. And what does that mean? It means you always got five people because if you have a problem, and by the way, they say that five is the greatest number because you have all of this input to you to try to help you solve anything. And then if there has to be a vote, you've got somebody to break the vote, see? So it is worthwhile. Now here's the other thing I want to make sure you understand about that. Once you put it together, there's people out there that I refer to as users and takers. What's that mean? It means they will use you and they will take you and they will get anything they can from you. And so you want to be able to identify them. And you want to make sure that they have to earn the right to stay on that one hand. Let me give you another thing that I teach under spirituality. is the ability to forgive. Okay? Now what does that mean? <clears throat> when you learn to forgive someone, always remember you're only uh, helping one person. You're helping yourself. And so People will do things to you, they'll do things to other people, and they won't blink an eye. And they'll keep doing it and doing it and doing it as long as you allow them to do so. So understand that when uh, you forgive them, you help yourself. See? And, and the, two, the great definition of total forgiveness is the, the ability to total forgive them and the ability to totally forget it. See? So one of my students asked me one time, and I said, uh, do you do that? I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I said, I, I forgive well. Will I ever forget? No, no. That good old Eastern Shore, you know, you do something to me, to me shame on you. You do it again, shame on me. See? It's not going to happen twice. So anyway, as you go through the social situation, and let me just uh, make another comment. Not only at the college, but in high school, and I think you're aware of this, we have a serious concern with binge drinking. What's binge drinking? You go to a party, you go somewhere. If you're male, you consume five drinks. If you're a female, you concern, consume four. One time in a two-week period, you're a binge drinker. Okay? Now, do we have a concern with that? Absolutely, we do. And so make sure that when you have the opportunity to educate people about anything, you make sure that you're there for them so they don't have to binge drink and they don't have to uh, rely on something else that's not there for them 24-7 like you need to be. Let me move on to another one. It's called intellectual wellness. My definition of intellectual wellness is the ability to learn something positive and put it into your life every single day. And let me give you a little goal. I do this with my stress management class. Every morning when you wake up, you have two goals. Today I'm going to be positive and happy. Now you'd be, su how, you'd be surprised how difficult that is to do a lot of days. But I will tell you something right now. I work on it. I try to make sure I'm, not, now my wife doesn't like it. You know, because when I wake up in the morning, you know, I'm happy and I'm singing songs and, and she'll just look at me like, at least let me have my coffee, okay, before you start acting like that, you know. But the point is, I am blessed, I'm a very positive, happy person, and there are a lot of people that aren't. So try to make other people positive and happy in your life as well. Um, the next one I want to talk about is something called occupational wellness. And there's a key word in that definition. Occupational wellness is, is our ability to uh, work hard, play hard, go to school, whatever we have to do in life with a balance of control. If I could give you one word that is the heart and soul of stress management is the ability to control your movement back and forth, whatever you want to do. I have a shirt at home uh, that somebody gave me from the Naval Academy and it says on it, Live hard, play harder. And what that basically means is your ability to give your best at all times. And then your ability to know how to relax without hurting anyone, including yourself. 
and under total control. They've done studies, and you've heard this, on personality types. A, pers uh, a, a type A personality is a person who drives, who wants everything perfect and so forth and so on. And they used to say, whatever you do, don't become a type A person. Be a type B. Well, in the beginning, if you were type A, you were going to have a heart attack. Now, if you're straight type B, you're going to get cancer. And one of the ways to get cancer is to put yourself in a situation where uh, you have a lot of concerns in the area of depression or in the areas of the ability to express what you think and feel, uh, the ability to like yourself and love yourself. And always remember this, there's only one person who will ever take great care of you, and that's you. And so don't look for someone else to blame. Go after this yourself and uh, take good care of yourself. And you can do that in a very humble way. And there's a lot of ways to do it. The other thing I wanted to mention to you about uh, occupational wellness, one of the greatest lessons I ever learned, and some of you have heard this name and some of you have not. There was a great basketball coach at Indiana University by the name of Bobby Knight. And he was the meanest SOB that you'd ever want to see. He would throw chairs at referees. He would scream and braille and break things and all this kind of stuff. So one day, I went to a coach's clinic. And I sat beside him in a booth in a restaurant. And he's talking to me and asking me about my family and all of this kind of stuff. And I'm just shaking my head. And finally, I said, I know he's going to hit me, but I'm going to ask him this question. I said, where's this guy we see on TV? And he said, after so many psychologists, and after so many psychiatrists, and two marriages, finally somebody told me how to lick this. And what they said was, you go be yourself when it comes to basketball. You give your best. You go out there and you be the person you are. But when you leave the word basketball, you take that basketball out of your head, you roll it down, and you go and live a life. Now, I thought he was just BSing me. We used to travel all over, New Jersey, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and I'd get home sometimes at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. So I'd walk in the house. My wife was curled up on the couch. And the vast majority of the time, thank goodness, she would say, hey, how are you, and everything like this, and talk to me and all this kind of stuff. But every once in a while, she'd look at me and she'd say, I'm glad you're home and safe. I'm going to bed. And I never knew why, because I wasn't smart enough to realize that. The reason she went to bed is because we lost. See? <laughs> and, and I don't like to lose, see? So I started doing this Bobby Knight stuff, see? I'd go in there and be myself and all this kind of stuff. And then when the game was over, I'd roll the ball in and I'd go home. Now here's the most important part of this story. And that is that she didn't care if we won or lost. She didn't like sports. See? She didn't care. And so all of a sudden she starts looking at me like, I can't tell if you won or lost. See? And then I was able to know that I had it under control. Those of you that had me in class, you remember this story. I'm going to share it with you because I think it's important. Uh, a professor um, walked into his classroom and he had this big, gigantic plastic uh, jar on his desk. And on that jar, he wrote the jar of life. And he reaches down, and he pulls out this, this burlap sack filled with rocks. And he fills the whole thing up with rocks. And he looks at the class, and he says, we got a full one? And of course, they said yes. And he said no. Then he reaches down, and he pulls up a bucket of gravel. He dumps it in. Some of you have heard this, but I got a couple things at the end to go with it, say and fills it up with gravel. Then he reaches down and he pulls up a bucket of sand and he pours the sand in. Now this thing's starting to, starting to fill up. See? And all of a sudden, uh, he has one more bucket. And in there, he has uh, water. And he brings the water up and he dumps it in. Now he's got a full one. See? And he said, now there's two morals to this story. It's very important. The sand, the gravel, and the water are negative things that come into your life. They will come in every single day. You can't always defend that. You can't always do anything about it. They're going to come. Okay? And, but, but, what do the rocks represent? The rock represent anything in your life that gives you passion. 
meaning, direction, purpose, great people, people you love, like, and appreciate, and so forth. But here's the most important thing to understand about this. Those other things are going to come, and they're going to fill your jar. But you have to put the rocks in first, see? And if you don't, you can't get them in, see? So the first thing you do is get a bunch of rocks. I had a young lady, after I told this story once, she came to my office, she knocked on the door. I opened, what do you got, 10? Keep me going. Get me, get me 15. We done with 15 yet? Yes. All right, last thing. She came in, she says, uh, starts to cry. And she said, I don't uh, have any rocks. I said, shame on you. You're the only person that can get the rocks. You're the only person to put them in, okay? Now, two quick things. I promise to be quiet. Uh, you need to understand there's a difference between athletic fitness and physical fitness. Make sure that you go after physical fitness for the rest of your life. Uh, my psychiatrist is a weight room. My psychologist is an elliptical. And if it wouldn't be for them, I'd be in bad shape, okay? The last thing I want to leave you, and then I'm done. I'm big into quotes. I'm big into this. I have this one beautiful picture in my home, and it has the ocean and the sun going down and so forth. And the quote is this, and this is, by the way, my favorite quote. And it says, uh, when the day is over and you've given your best, wait the results in peace. Now that is the only way that a human being can be judged. Did you give your best? Congratulations to all the inductees. God bless all of you. God bless our troops. And thank you for having me here tonight. All right, we're going we're gonna to take a quick five-minute kind of recess, get back, and then we'll begin with the awards. So really, the true reason that we've gathered here tonight um, is to honor a select few of high school athletes that have reached kind of a pinnacle of their high school uh, athletic career, and we would like to recognize them. Kennon High School, as I mentioned earlier, turned 20 years old this year. And with that milestone, a group of staff members embarked on creating the Ken Allen High School Athletic Hall of Fame. These dedicated members of the Ken Allen High School faculty created a vision and mission and quite a criteria for this Hall of Fame. At this time, I would like anybody that was on the committee to please stand. So that would mean the table to my left. Thank you guys very much for your time and dedication. The purpose of the Ken Allen High School Sports Hall of Fame is to honor and recognize those individuals and teams who through their accomplishments have brought pride and distinction to our school and community as either an athlete, a coach, an administrator, or as a contributor to the development and success of the Ken Allen High School athletic program. And I think that's important. I think the, the qualifications that the team, that the, the group really set up were pretty distinguished. You had to participate in Kennel High School Athletics. As an athlete, you had to receive a varsity letter and or receive all shore, all conference, all district, all sectional, or all state honors. And you needed to have graduated a minimum of five years, so I'm not sure the right way to say that, but you had to have graduated no less than five years from today. There's also, though, the coaches who coach at Kennon High School for at least five years and made their mark. There's also those that have given a tremendous amount of service. While not an athlete or a coach, they provided a tremendous impact to the athletic program at Kennon High School. Just for the record, and really it was Melissa Osborne's idea the, for me to mention this, the vision is also that any individual going forward that wins a individual state championship will automatically be nominated five years from their date of graduation. So that's just to give you kind of a, an outline of where we're going from tonight. Being the inaugural class, we really have been figuring out most of this as we go. Um, but the reason we are here, and I'm going to ask John Schreckengoss, the uh, Callum High School principal, to join me. We are here to recognize 11 inductees well-deserving people, each of them will receive a personalized clock to take home and a plaque. There will be a plaque displayed within Canal High School um, really until the building closes. Uh, so it'll be there for a long, long time. And that's probably the biggest debate is 
What, how do you create a wall that's going to be memorable yet long lasting? So that's been a, a, a constant uh, point of debate throughout this process. But without any further ado, I'd like to bring up Mr. Schreckengoss and begin recognizing our inductees. All right. So, the first inductee of our inaugural class of the Kennell High School Athletic Hall of Fame, Melissa Osborne. Class of 2009. Melissa, do you want to come up as I say some things about you? So I'm going to read the biography that was given to us as the inductees were selected. Melissa Osborne is a perfect example of an all-around athlete. From 2005 to 2009, Melissa not only participated, but also excelled at soccer, basketball, and softball. As a basketball player, Melissa was a four-year starting guard and forward. She served as team captain both her junior and senior years. She was named the second team All-Midshore in 2006, first team All-Midshore in 2007 and 2008, offensive MVP in 2007, and had over 1,000 career points. She helped lead her team, this is only the first paragraph, she helped lead her team to become the North Bayside champions in 2006 and Bayside Conference champions in 2008. But that was just one season. In the fall, Melissa took her skills to the soccer field. She was a three-year varsity player and captain of her team in 2008. She was named to the second team all-midshore for midfield in 2006, and first team all-midshore for goalie in 2007 and 2008. Under her leadership, her team was named North Bayside champions in 2007 and 2008. When spring rolled around, Melissa moved to softball diamond, where she also excelled. She was a four-year varsity starter. Once again, the coach saw Melissa's leadership skills, and she was named captain for both 2008 and 2009 seasons. She was named second team all-midshore in 2008 and first team all-midshore in 2009. Melissa's commitment to her sports and education earned her the title of Maryland Scholar Athlete for 2006, 2007, 2008, and 2009, as well as Master of Sports for 2007, 2008, and 2009. After graduating from Cat Island, Melissa took her softball talents to Dickinson College, where she continued to dominate. Fortunately for us, Melissa has returned to her alma mater, where she leads the, oh, it said guidance department, but I know it to be the school, school counseling, counseling department, <laughs> mentors the students and continue to share her athletic skills as, as a coach both in softball and our basketball programs. Congratulations, Melissa. Thank you. All week at lunch, to to at lunch duty, we have joked about a speech, and I have said from every day for an hour and a half, two hours, absolutely not. Though, I will say thank you to everybody that supported me along the way, my parents, Coaches and my current minister. <laughs> Our next inductee, Allison McIntosh, class of 2009. Over here with you. Thanks. <laughs> Allie is a 2009 graduate of Kent Island High School. While at Kent Island High School, Allie was a three-season athlete participating in field hockey, basketball, and lacrosse. On the hockey field, under the leadership of Coach Tubman, Allie was a four-year varsity starter who received many accolades. As a sophomore, Allie held the school record for scoring 34 goals and having seven assists. That year, she was named All-Midshore First Team and received the Ken Allen Field Hockey Most Dominate, Dominating Scorer Award. She also helped to lead her team to becoming the Bayside Champions as well as the 2A East Regional Champions. As a junior, Allie scored 19 goals, had five assists, and was named All-Midshore Player of the Year along with Ken Island, Ken Island Field Hockey Offensive MVP. Once again, the 2007 Lady Bucks captured the 2A East Regional title. As a senior, Allie held the record of Midshore uh, leading scorer by scoring 27 goals. She was named First Team All-Midshore and helped her team not only to a perfect 18-0 season, but also to the 2A State Championship title. After high school, Allie continued to dominate on the hockey field at St. Mary's College in St. Mary's, Maryland. Congratulations. Thank 
I'm very thankful for the Cosgrove and Tubman family because my family is on vacation, so they didn't find it important enough to be here for me. But um, yeah, but um, at least I'm really thankful to at least be a part of the Ken Island family. And Rick Tubman is the bomb, and all the other coaches that I have here. But thanks a lot. Thank you. Our next inductee, Amanda Verkitz, class of 2002. Amanda's drive, determination, and skill have led her to become one of the best female track athletes the Bayside Conference and 1A, 2A East Region had ever seen. The 2001 cross country team in which Mandy was the captain of went undefeated in the regular season. Individually, Mandy has an overall record of 16-0 in indoor and outdoor Bayside championships. She is 15-1 in regional championships, no woman in the history of Bayside and 1A, 2A East Regional Championships have ever won four in a row. Mandy did this three of her four times she competed. In the 16 events that Mandy had competed in on the state level, she averaged a third place finish. Mandy graduated Kent Island High School holding 16 school records, four of which she still holds 15 years later. Mandy continued her running career running for and breaking one of the University of Maine's school records. Congratulations. so much because nobody likes to run it's punishment for every other sport um, and I think I love it because it's brutally honest and at the end of the day uh, that's a tough lesson to learn but at the end of the day you either ran that fast or you didn't you, there's not a lot of ways to cheat track and field it's not a team sport so much as it is an individual uh, collective um, where you can't blame your your bad race on a bad call from a referee or you know a teammate or, or anything like that it's you against the clock or it's you against um, your own self and I think those lessons of responsibility uh, taking ownership of who you are is why I love it and um, so a thank you to Kent Island to Coach Holland to my parents um, to help me uh, push me in those areas to learn uh, to learn responsibility and learn those areas so that now no matter what I face in life or what we as athletes face um, in our future endeavors, uh, you can take ownership of that and you can um, really walk without fear um, into anything. And, um, so thank you, Ken. Our next inductee of our nar the inaugural class of the Kennan High School Athletic Hall of Fame, Jen Cosgrove, class of 2010. <laughs> As a 2010 graduate of Ken Island High School, Jen excelled in soccer and lacrosse. During her time on the women's lacrosse team, again under the leadership of Coach Tubman, Jen was a three-year starter and tallied a collective 201 goals and 57 assists, making her the all-time leading scorer. While only a sophomore, Jen held the record for most points that season with her 86 goals and 26 assists and was named to the Under Armour All-American team as well as inside lacrosse top 25 women rising juniors. In her junior year, Jen scored 77 goals, had 21 assists, and received high school All-American honors. While playing for Maryland United Lacrosse Club, she helped lead her team to the 2009 Club National Championship Finals. Jen was also named first team All-Midshore in 2008 and Player of the Year in 2009. After graduating from high school, Jen took her lacrosse talents to Coastal Carolina, where she continued to excel. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. No pressure, but are you going to talk? 
Uh, I guess and I would have you like the to... microphone? No, thank you. Okay. Um, at this point, <laughs> all of my teammates did. So um, just thank you to my family and definitely all my teammates. They were, you can't play a sport without your team. And um, Tubman and Soph, I couldn't have done it without you. I uh, went through some injuries through college, and Soph and Tubman were definitely there through the summers. Um, and my parents, for sure. So thank you so much. And Ken Island High School, go Bucks! Congratulations. Next, I'd like to welcome up Devin Gardner, class of 2008. Devin's a 2008 graduate of Cowan High School, a three-year starting pitcher and outfielder for the Bucks varsity baseball team. He was named to the All Bayside and All State All Star team in 2008. Not only did Devin lead his team to the 2008 state championship, he was named MVP of the annual Brooks Robinson Senior State All Star game played at Camden Yards. Devin went two for three with a home run and double. Coach Brainer remembered that. In 2009 and 2010, Devin was a standout pitcher for the Chesapeake College baseball team. He was selected second team all region pitcher in 2009 and first team all region pitcher in 2010. On May 9, 2010, Devin pitched a no-hitter against Delaware Technical College. He was named to the Chesapeake College Dean's List in 2009 and 2010. In 2011 and 2012, Devin pitched for, the Sal for Salisbury University's baseball team. He earned the CAC Pitcher of the Week honor in February of 2012. Devin was also named to the Salisbury University's Dean's List in 2011 and 2012. Devin currently is teaching physical education in Arundel County and he also helps coach the Broadneck High School baseball team. Congratulations. Hair's a little shorter than this, <laughs> but it's a great honor, and I'm really appreciative. And thank you, guys, and have a great night. Congratulations. Our next inductee is Casey Lyons, class of 2007. I don't believe, yeah, see, I don't believe Casey could be here tonight. Though, here's how he is described: diverse and talented are two words that come to mind when thinking of Casey. And actually, I think Coach Holland should probably come up and give a speech at the end of this. His races have ranged in, ranged in distance from three miles in cross country to even setting a school record as a sprinter on the 800 meter relay team. In cross country, Casey was the Bayside Conference Runner of the Year, winning the Bayside and Regional title. He again won Bayside's Runner of the Year for indoor track after winning several individual titles, leading the Buccaneers to a Bayside championship. Casey finished his indoor season by winning the 1600 meter run, setting his second state class 2A record. Casey ran the anchor leg in the state class 2A record-breaking 3200 meter relay. In outdoor track, Casey again won several individual events at Bayside and Regionals, leading the team to another Bayside and Regional Championship. Casey left Ken Island with three outdoor school records, five indoor school records, two 2A state championships and records. Casey led the team to 10 regional and conference championships and a state runner-up. He continued his running career attending Winthrop University and was awarded Freshman Runner of the Year for the Big South Conference. Yeah, Coach John, I want you to come on up and accept the award on Casey's behalf. If you don't want to say a few words, I understand. No, I'm not allowed for words. No, I don't. Do I need to speak? You don't want to speak? No, I'm, okay. I'm not one to speak, so. Perfect. <laughs> I just want to be able to speak. So Coach Holland went around the room uh, all during dinner uh, coaching, as he said, all of the athletes to say a few words after I had told him they didn't have to. So, all right. Our next inductee, Jack Hutchinson, class of 2006. <laughs> So as Jack's bio reads, he exemplified phrases people say every day, just do it. Jack rarely had a bad day on the track, even having to run in a torrential downpour. Yes, in 2005, he had to defend his state championship 300 meter hurdle title in the rain. He was successful in his defense for that title, winning it in a runaway. No excuses. Jack was not perfect on the track. His junior year during the indoor track state championship, Jack was seated to beat the field. In the 55 
uh, meter hurdles by a large margin. He false started in the qualifying race and was disqualified. Thank you. Coach Holland did not forget. <laughs> when asked what happened, got so far down. <laughs> yep. When asked what happened, Jack simply said, "I messed up. It was all my fault." Jack never folded under the pressure when the team needed him the most. In 2006, Jack came into the state championship meet with, for the first time, the team having a chance at the state title. He also had the added pressure of having one race in which he was undefeated for his entire high school career, the 300 meter hurdles. During the race, Jack, as usual, came down the back stretch of the track with a commanding lead. When for the first time in his career, something went wrong. There's a theme here. <laughs> he fell. Jack is not one to just give up. He got up like many, many hurdlers do after they fall in a race. The only exception is Jack had built such a lead that when he got up, he still had a chance to win. Jack's thought was not that he might lose, but that the team might lose. To the entire crowd's astonishment, and amidst their cheers, Jack won the race and led the track team to the school's highest finish in a state competition, runner-up. When Jack graduated in 2006, he held 11 school records, six current, five state championships, and was nationally ranked in the hurdles both his junior and senior years. Jack ran the 300-meter hurdles in outdoor track for three years. He never lost a race in that event the entire three years, including three state titles. He still remains top points in career and single seasons for both indoor and outdoor track and field. Jack led the team to 10 regional and conference championships and a state runner-up. He attended Coastal Carolina College where he continued his success. Sorry. Yes. Where he continued his success breaking their school record for the hurdles. Congratulations. Thanks a lot, everybody. I appreciate it. Thanks for bringing that one up because, like I said, I had, I had pushed that so far away from me and now it came back up. But, um, so, kind of like every day, my neck hurts a lot and my, my lower back is really killing me all the time. And shoulder's pretty busted and my elbow hurts. Uh, my hips are really tight. My Achilles is kind of tingly just all the time. And, and I think about, like, man, I'm so beat up, and I wonder why. And I'm like, oh, that's right, because because I, I, like, went for it all the time. And um, and that's really important. I think that going for it all the time is kind of what makes a difference and what makes people come up here and get recognized. And I appreciate it so much, the coaches and the staff and the administration, everybody who, who I guess, gives you the platform to stand on to be good at these kind of things, because without coaches and administration and boosters and – the track and you know field houses and all these equipment and all the stuff that we didn't have to pay for that we just showed up for and it was there available to us that was really important to us so I want to say thanks to everybody for all those kind of things and all my injuries like I, I every day I wake up and I feel kind of crummy but I'm like oh that's so worth it it's like why not wear it out you know what I mean so just keep wearing your bodies out it's like you know who cares right whatever so um, but again thank you so much for giving us this platform to to perform and just be do our best so thanks Thank you. All right, our, our next inductee to the uh, inaugural class of the Kenton High School Athletic Hall of Fame is Andy Shippel. Andy Stanley, received the recognition. Andy was born in Fort Dix, New Jersey. Graduated from Henderson Senior High School in 1971, where he participated in football, wrestling, and lacrosse. After graduating from Westchester University in 1975 with a bachelor's degree in health and physical education, Andy continued to use his athletic talents by coaching in Queen Anne's County. Andy coached football and wrestling at both Queen Anne's County and Canal High School from 1975 till 2005. He also took an active role serving on the Maryland State Lacrosse Committee, National Wrestling Coaches Association, District 7 and 8 Wrestling Coaches Association, the Lacrosse Foundation, and the Maryland State Wrestling Coaches Association. Andy was also recognized as the Midshore Lacrosse Coach of the Year in 1993, Bayside Wrestling Coach of the Year in 1979, and numerous District 7 and 8 Coaches Awards for Outstanding Sportsmanship Awards. Under Andy's leadership, Kevin Barney and John Waters were both state wrestling champions. In 2002, the Kenton High School Stadium field was named in his honor, the house that Chip built. It is with great pleasure that we induct Andy Shippel into the Kenton High School Athletic Hall of Fame. Congratulations.
On behalf of my pop up Shipple, um, I thank you. He was a very good man. He had 250 wins. I play all the sports that he coached, and hope, and I'm hoping that I can co coach all of them too. Thank you. Our next inductee is Dave Cooper. Dave Cooper served as Kenton High School's athletic director from 1998 until 2012. As Kenton High School's athletic director, Dave Cooper scheduled hundreds of home and away games, ensured proper coverage at all home events, and created an atmosphere that was positive and exciting. Most importantly, Dave had the daunting task of getting every athletic program at Kenton High School underway. Having served as athletic director for Queen Anne's County High School, Dave certainly understood what a huge project this would be. So he split his time serving as athletic director for both schools and was able to not only start up 35 teams, but under his leadership at Kent Island High School, produced two team state championships, baseball and field hockey, six individual state championships, track and swimming, one individual regional championship in tennis, and 37 regional championships and 38 Bayside championships. And that's just for Kent Island. So Dave, congratulations. Thank you. It's up to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I would like to offer my congratulations to all of the inductees. Um, very humbling and honored. I'm honored to be selected. I, I really don't think I did anything special. It was just my job. And, try to do it to the best of my ability with admittedly varying degrees of success. <laughs> um, but, and I would like to recognize my wife and two daughters who are here. Um, as all of you are in athletics know, there are a lot, a lot of nights out. Now, my wife didn't wait up for me. <laughs> 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 Actually, she did. <laughs> that was nice, but I really appreciate it. It's such it's hard to believe it's been 20 years. But um, congratulations to everybody again, and thank you very much. I now would like to bring up Jeff Harriman. Jeff grew up in Arnold, graduated from Severna Park High School in 1970. He went on to Miami, Ohio University, where he graduated in 1974 with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Finance. After college, he became a Navy pilot and later went to work for, ooh, that'd be a problem, for U.S. Air before retiring in 2008. Since retiring, he has worked for Callaway Golf and resides in Wilmington, North Carolina. Jeff was one of the original presidents that established the Kent Island High School Athletic Boosters. He was instrumental in organizing and starting the bylaws and uh, present workings of this great supporting body at Kent Island High School. Jeff established the scholarships and awards that are presently awarded to dozens of student athletes. Most notably, Jeff and Jerry were responsible for forming the committee to design and construct the field house at Andy Shipple Stadium. Not only did Jeff help design and organize the construction, but he was responsible for finding the financial donors to finance such a large construction project. He and Jerry spent endless hours working on the project themselves, painting and placing the flooring in the locker rooms and coach's office. Both Jeff and Jerry erected fences throughout the Kent Island High School athletic fields. Jeff is supported by his wife Patty, son Chris, and wife Nicole, and grandkids. Avery and Amelia and his daughter Lindsay, who was a 2004 graduate and valedictorian of Ken Allen High School. Congratulations. Congratulations. I moved uh, away from here about 12 years ago, and one of the reasons I wanted to come back was one, so there's a plaque over one of those locker rooms here, and everybody's probably going, who is this guy? <laughs> so I thought I'd come back. 
to uh, Gracieville, Stevensville, Kent Island, and uh, let you see the face associated with that flight. <laughs> it's extremely gratifying to come back and see the shape that the athletic program, the high school, and the Boosters Club. We planted the seed, the journey has come this far, and I'm sure that it will continue to get better and better as we go along. But uh, both uh, Jerry, who you'll meet momentarily, and I are very proud of our accomplishments. Uh, we did a lot of work way back then, and it's all Dave Cooper's fault. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. I appreciate the induction, and the best of luck to each and every one of you. Thank you. So while, while Jeff's getting that, I'll tell you that I, I met Jerry the other day. Uh, he came in to pick up tickets and stopped in and we talked and the, the things that, that they accomplished. And Jerry, if you want to come on up now, I'll go ahead and welcome you. Jerry Remanap was, uh, grew up in Detroit, Michigan before moving to Maryland. It says here you also graduated from Saberta Park High School, is that yes, correct? Yes, did. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. After graduating from Rhett's Electronic School, he began working as a facilities manager. I got a whole thing here. Yeah, I see. <laughs> yeah. For Northrop Grumman, where he's been for 44 years. Jerry was one of the original vice presidents that established the Kent Island High School Athletic Boosters. He, too, was instrumental in organizing and starting the bylaws and present workings of the Kent Island High School Athletic Boosters. He helped establish the scholarships and awards that are presently awarded to all those student athletes. Most notably, Jerry and Jeff were responsible for forming the committee to design and construct the field house. Well, on the bottom of their plaques is a etching of that field house. Jerry spent endless hours working on the projects, painting and placing the flooring in the locker rooms in the coach's office. I think you actually mentioned much, much more than that. Financing and constructing <laughs> fences and pretty much Everything that I believe that we see on campus today, in some way or another, Jeff and Jerry had a large part to do with it. Jerry is supported by his wife, Debbie, and two sons, Andrew and Craig, who both graduated from Canal High School. Congratulations. Thank you. I would like to thank Jeff, obviously. We worked long hours, but it wasn't without to help of other people. Pat, Patty, So, Dave, and the, and the kids that have graduated. You know, Coach Holland, I see him over there smiling. He can't talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Never could. <laughs> Mr. Tubman, it was great to see him here. Um, but it's great to see the Jacks and the Mandys. They've grown up, you know. I haven't gotten any older, but I want to know where my gold jacket is. Yeah, that's a great question. We were told we were getting gold jackets. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I appreciate it. I thank everybody. It humble and experience. Thank you. Congratulations. So I want to say one final thank you to the staff, the coaches, the families, the athletes that are, are here tonight. This is, this is really much more of an imp impressive event than I even thought when we started. Uh, looking out at all the accomplishments of those athletes that are here, the families, it really, it, it's, just a, it's just a great night. Um, so I just wanna thank you once again for coming out. Uh, this does conclude the awards and induction uh, part of the evening. I'm sure you can, uh, I'm, I'm looking back here to see, are they okay to hang around for a little while? All right, enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you very much.